Dear guests, speakers and organizers, welcome to our live session on making the EU resilient against disinformation and foreign interference. My name is Oksana Romanyuk. I'm a director of Ukrainian think tank and NGO, uh, Institute of Mass Information. We focus on media content analysis and support the freedom of expression and fight against disinformation. And I hope that you will enjoy today's session. Well, um, years of disinformation and political interference of Russia in Ukraine have culminated in Russia waging war against Ukraine, which is accompanied by even more Russian disinformation targeting EU and third countries in an attempt to manipulate public opinion and weaken the solidarity with Ukraine. This demonstrated really painfully how Hostile foreign governments may use disinformation and interfere in the democratic processes of other countries as a prequel, actually, to military intervention or economic coercion. They engage in media campaigns that spread false narratives, increasing resentment, distrust against political institutions, actors, exploiting social divides, and such attacks, they pose a serious threat to the security, to independence of democratic countries. And with social media becoming more fundamental to daily life and political decision-making process, but digital media literacy, particularly of the younger generation, now it is key to the resilience of democratic societies. And our panel discussion today aims to present the strategies and the related tools in place through which the EU can address these challenges and reflect on how to research, on how research and innovation can support future policy action. And actually, I, um, as I'm speaking to you now from Kyiv, I will add some expertise from the front line of this really painful and terrible disinformation which we see now in Ukraine. Since the beginning of the invasion, we have seen the growth of old disinformation narratives as well as the development of new ones aimed specifically at EU. And we understand the reasons because for Russia, the massive hospitality of um, citizens of European countries to Ukrainians, it became a surprise because the European Union provided really large scale support. And this contradicts with the Russian disinformation depicting the West as something hostile, something terrible. All topics of Russian disinformation dehumanize Ukraine and Ukrainians. And if you write them down in a row, one story will be more threatening than the other, like fascists who smuggle arms, uh, drug trafficking, world hunger, nuclear danger, and all these threatening scenes, they come to consumers of information. Of course, they should create a feeling of maximum danger coming from Ukraine and create an impression of an emergency situation which should be somehow uh, solved. Uh, and this, uh, of course, motivate people to um, take arms. And I would add some more um, point what Russia is doing now uh, in Mariupol, in Kherson, in Berdyansk and other occupied territories, which is a dangerous psychological experiment um, that is not talked mu about much because we often discuss disinformation, but we um, do not speak about results of this um, propaganda. We speak little about um, this um, psychological effect, uh, the erasure of identity, erasure of language, destruction of culture, destruction of material traces of this uh, culture. And uh, this inflicts really severe psychological injuries on people. So what can we done with this level, with this level of disinformation? In my opinion, it can only be affected by a kind of Nuremberg style tribunal, a global demonstration that um, this kind of disinformation is really crime because those people who really consume disinformation for years, who live in other reality, 
um, who, believe, who trust into this disinformation, and this may be the reason why they support the genocidal policy of Putin and perhaps only global recognition of this really shameful and terrible situation will help and will help to prevent this happening in future again. So today we will discuss strategies related tools in place through which the European Union can address these challenges and reflect on future policy actions. And before we start, I would like um, to invite you to participate in uh, an electronic poll. We will create, uh, we will combine our session today with a kind of research. So you will see um, the first slide. There will be a poll um, with uh, the first question, which are the main sources of disinformation affecting European citizens, in your opinion? And uh, please respond, we will, we will sum up after this session uh, what we think about it. And the second question, the second poll is, in your view, which countries are the most active in trying to influence public opinion in the EU via disinformation? And here you please um, suggest your uh, variants. So uh, I'm very happy to introduce you our speakers who are very well known um, researchers and very well known uh, really experts in the sphere of disinformation. Our first speaker is uh, Ms. Kalina Boncheva, Professor Dr. Kalina Boncheva, who leads the Natural Language Processing Group at the Department of Computer Science at University of Sheffield. And she's also a member of uh, Sheffield Center for Freedom of the Media and senior research leader at the Big Data and Smart Society Institute in Bulgaria. I know, Ms. Kalina, that you have your presentation. So please, uh, can you share with us your um, findings and research, please? Thank you very much. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be uh, here today. And um, could I have the slides uh, displayed, please? So uh, today uh, I will be discussing the challenges and trends in uh, content verification. Um, specifically, uh, my perspective, it comes from a uh, background in artificial intelligence. And we've been working on uh, for over 10 years now on that uh, important challenge. How can we help verification professionals and fact checkers uh, to address uh, and more effectively uncover disinformation, verify content and um, provide effectively debunks in an efficient manner. Next slide, please. So um, I have just uh, started to work as the scientific manager of the Vera, Vera AI project. This is a Horizon Europe project that has started last week. And uh, we'll be working towards developing and improving existing AI technology, specifically to uh, enable better detection of multilingual and multimodal disinformation. Uh, also addressing uh, deep fakes, uh, the detection of synthetic and also manipulated content, not just images, but also videos and text. Um, the other very big challenge is the uncovering of low credibility accounts and sites so we can flag those automatically to the professionals. Um, and um, very importantly, they're spending a lot of time trying to uncover narratives and quantify their impacts and uh, who is involved in these disinformation campaigns. Um, so we're looking at network science methods and uh, other methods from uh, the areas of uh, other areas of AI in order to uh, improve the disinformation analysis of narratives and campaign detection. And lastly, to improve the support and intelligent tools available to fact checkers and verification professionals. Next slide, please. So here um, you will see that there are already some wi very widely used tools in existence. This is the um, main page of the Invit We Verify verification plugin, which is being used by 75,000 users every week uh, from over two, uh, 220 countries worldwide. Uh, you can download this from your Chrome store. I won't have time to go in depth, but um, next please. Um, here, uh, you can see some examples of how text can be extracted from memes and translated to help. Please, next one. 
and also this is the verification assistant. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I must say that it's very important to bring technology and stakeholders together because technology on its own uh, will not be adopted very well. So this is the role of the European uh, Disinformation uh, Digital Media Observatory or EDMO, which brings together the technology to fact checkers, media literacy experts and academic researchers as well. And um, very important aspects are um, that EDMO advocates for improved data access and cooperation between platforms and researchers, because in order to continue development of effective AI tools to counter disinformation, access to data uh, is key. In that regard, we often have platforms use GDPR as an excuse. However, the latest EDMA report on platform to research data access unmasks that and provides very practical recommendations and way forward. I won't have time to go in depth into the investigations uh, that are being carried out by EDMO, but I do encourage you to look at that, as well as the recommendations which EDMO has recently published on how to improve this going forward. Thank you. And uh, I hope that we will have opportunity to speak about it in depth a little bit later at this panel. And now I would like, uh, thank you for your presentation, and I would like to um, pass the floor to Mr. Ono hansen Stashinsky, expert, uh, who is a member of the Commission Expert Group on Tackling Disinformation and Promoting Digital Literacy. I know that Mr. Ono is a former journalist, and he's a researcher and co-director of the uh, Big Horst Institute. Please, um, Mr. Stash uh, Hansen Stashinsky, uh, tell us about your uh, findings and research. Thank you very much. Well, what is most important for us is to understand this information because it's not very clear what it is. There are very many trends to describe this information and there are very many answers to it. So we tried at Binkhorst Institute, which is a part of Droch. Droch once made a, a game called Bad News. Uh, there was debunking and that's generation three. What you see here are five generations that we try to identify. First was strategic communication, then we had debunking or fact checking, then we had pre-bunking. Then we had denial of service, so trying to deplatform, for instance, and now we're talking about interactionalists, so basically talking with people who are on the receiving end on how to receive this information. It doesn't mean there is better or worse, it's just waves of thinking that follow up on each other every few years, and we try to understand both what it means for this information, also what it means for uh, how to deal with it, how to tackle it. Um, I myself am mostly involved in the five, fifth generation, so talking with people about what's happening. And that sounds easier than it is, because basically we don't have frames for it yet. We don't even have a good a definition. So basically what we try to do is set a stage with students mostly, but also with teachers and with anybody who wants to talk about it, to create a, a, a sort of environment, how to talk about this information in a constructive way. And for instance, we do that at school together with my wife I do that but also that's the current media thing but also dynamic identity that's how we train teachers and basically it's about how do you deal with diverse subjects in the classroom and that was also part of what I contributed to the expert group uh, the Commission uh, will uh, uh, publish both the final report and the guidelines on October 11th and basically what we try to do there is give the whole line of work of how to do deal with this as teachers in the classroom. And what I want to add to it is, there's a big difference between researchers outcomes and what you do in the classroom. And it's great that this gap is being sort of bridged. So that's my contribution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. And I would like to pass the floor to uh, Ms. Ramona Miglinaite, who is uh, part of the East Stratcom Task Force established to monitor, analyze, and challenge pro-Kremlin disinformation. And she also develops uh, EU versus disinfo awareness raising campaigns and analysis analyzes pro-Kremlin disinformation. Um, please tell us about your work, work and your findings. Uh, yes, thank you very much. And it's uh, a real pleasure for me to be among such uh, great scientists and hear also about this amazing research, which also to a large extent informs our work uh, within the institutions. Uh, and speaking about our work in the institutions, I would like to take you to the very beginning um, 
or rather the inception of EU-wide efforts to counter uh, disinformation, uh, which takes us back to March 2015, when European Council, so European uh, heads of state and government, gave us, uh, the External Action Service, a very specific mandate, uh, challenge Russia's ongoing disinformation campaigns. Hence, this is our focus. We have been doing that since 2015, and the task for us was always very clear. Uh, but of course, the European leaders didn't tell us exactly how one is supposed to challenge Russia's ongoing disinformation campaigns. Uh, what is an effective way to do that, but also what is a legitimate way to do that for a new institution? And we've been shaping our work uh, in three main strands uh, ever since. Uh, and probably the thing that we're most known for and most visible uh, for is awareness raising. So we an monitor and analyze and expose pro Kremlin disinformation campaigns, specific narratives. We use social media and you versus info website for that and the idea behind it is to inoculate the public if we if the Europeans and and people in our neighborhood in Eastern partnership countries especially are aware of uh, pro Kremlin disinformation campaigns the thinking is that they will become more resilient the second big strand of our work uh, is reflected reflects the idea uh, that if there is uh, an efficient and uh, very clear communication out there about what it is that we are, the, what EU is, what our values are, then it will be harder for disinformation to spread, that the credible information is sort of a barrier to disinformation. So a part of our work is to make sure that EU effectively uh, communicates more effectively also in its neighborhood. And finally, um, and it is very important, I think no matter how uh, good we are at communication as European institutions, uh, the independent and pluralistic media is really the ultimate line of defense, if you will, against disinformation. It is, people will always turn to their media, to their journalists uh, for verified information. So what we see as one of our tasks is to also strengthen media environment, uh, especially in the EU's our neighborhood. So these are the three, the three main strands of our work that we've been working uh, diligently since 2015. But um, since then, uh, the EU response really evolved a lot and I, I would argue made uh, big strides uh, and I hope we can talk about it uh, throughout that discussion. Uh, thank you, Ms. Miglinaita. And now I have a question to all our panelists. Please, um, can you tell us briefly, um, we have uh, unfortunately, <laughs> we are short in time, so uh, can you tell us three main challenges that, in your opinion, you must face in the field of countering disinformation and FEMI. Are there any gaps, maybe three, three main gaps, in your opinion? Are there any actors who are not involved and or maybe somebody who is involved but is ineffective? So uh, please, um, uh, Ms. Kalina Boncheva, can you have, tell us? Okay. Thank you. That's a great question. From our own experience and research, I would say one of the main challenges is the fact that this information is cross-border and it's also multilingual. Uh, whereas uh, what we've been seeing in many cases are the responses are uh, very country-specific and localized by uh, national fact-checkers. Uh, and uh, also the, the different responses by the platforms are very much country specific, whereas, um, and it's also language specific. However, um, as, as, we, as I mentioned, in many cases, these narratives um, and uh, disinformation spread across these countries. Um, the other challenge in many cases is that uh, the platforms such as Facebook are relying too heavily on uh, local fact checkers in each country. However, in specifically in Central and Eastern Europe, um, these fact checkers have very limited resources. So disinformation is spreading a lot faster than it, it is in Western Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Boncheva, and uh, please, Mr. Uh, Ono Hansen Stasinski, what are three main challenges in your opinion? What are three main gaps, maybe? I'll keep it at one. Normal people. I think we should involve normal people much more. What we now tell them is basically one thing. Know your facts and share, but think before you share. 
I think the level of involvement could be much higher. So what I would love to have is much more pop uh, population participation, normal people participating in tackling this information. I think this is the main gap that we have on the moment. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Raimonda Miglinait, what are the main gaps in your opinion? Well, I think I will echo my fellow panelists here a little bit. And um, I think uh, first it's also a challenge how do we uh, learn from each other in the best way across the European Union with such a diversity that we have within the member states and, and the, you know, the different approaches to this issue. So how do we make the most of that uh, beautiful diversity? But also I think um, another challenge is really uh, related to the nature of the threat, if you will. Um, this is a very fast uh, paced environment. The challenge involves constantly disinformation actors use new and new techniques and uh, very frequently we need quick reactions um, to what's happening. But when we talk about things like resilience building, media literacy and digital literacy, these are things that normally take time and, and long-term investment. So how do we make it work both in the short term and also long term? I think this is another thing we need to figure out. Thank you, Ms. Miglinaita. So, um how can all stakeholders tackle better the cross-border and this diversity, this cross-platform nature of this information? I would address this question to uh, Ms. Kalina Boncheva. Thank you. Um, I think basically uh, it's very important for all the funders and the platforms to invest more, a lot more heavily into the development of multilingual technologies and tools that they can use, because at the moment they are too heavily biased again towards Western languages. That whereas um, the coverage of, uh, of those tools and, and efforts is a lot less uh, sophisticated for Eastern, Central and Eastern European languages. I, I would also say that, again, cross-border collaboration between these different stakeholders is essential. At the moment, they're just too nationalist focused. Um, we need technology which is available in all EU languages and fact checkers to help each other to multiply the, uh, the effects of their work. And finally, I think it's very important to have policymakers and platforms to work together towards a cross-platform cooperation and investigation of this information, rather than the current very siloed approach. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Ms. Boncheva. And my another question is to Mr. Han, uh, Onno Hansen Stashinsky: What target groups should be more involved, in your opinion, in tackling this information in the field of education and journalism? Well, I would again say normal people, and the reason for it is quite simple. Uh, this information gets really serious the moment that people use it as a pretext to violate human rights or, if, or, or, cause, consider, or uh, cause credible harm. So what we need is to have recipients on board. And I think that education and journalism are two ways of getting people on board. And one of the ways to do it is, I think that tasks should be to gather data, to organize data, to explicitly explain about the data, but then not top down talk about these data that they've gathered and the information they have, but rather start it like a, a, a community service, a dialogue with people. And there are countries where that happens. And I think this is the new way for education and journalism to go ahead, to be more as a service to people rather than top down telling how it is. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Hansen Stashinsky. That's very interesting. And my another question would be to Ms. Raimonda Miglinaite. So um, the EU toolbox to counter disinformation and foreign interference. Um, you have already uh, told us, but uh, can you tell us, um, is it working actually? What is missing? In your opinion, uh, what is it? And uh, maybe give us some more details how uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is something that we're continuously working on and, and uh, you know, it's, it's an ever-evolving toolbox, if you will. But the departure point, I think, is very important to understand is this uh, understanding that democracies are vulnerable for hybrid threats and disinformation, or rather what we call foreign information manipulation and interference, meaning that it's not only the spread of untruthful information, but, for example, also attempts to suppress independent voices. So it's a broader phenomena that that is uh, a threat to democracy. And uh, the departure point is how do we 
impose costs to perpetrators uh, because this still remains a relatively low cost and high impact activity. So how do we increase those costs? And this is really, um, uh, it could be a long list, but uh, very briefly, uh, we were thinking in four very broad categories. Um, the first is, has to do with situational awareness. So how do we know what's out there and what's happening? In particular, you know, we as the external action service, we look outwards, so beyond the European Union. But so not only how do we know things, but how do we share information with our partners globally and, and, and with, with civil society? The second big part of the toolbox is about resilience building. So the stratcoms, the media literacy, digital literacy, all these crucial programs, again, that require long term investment and that are ongoing. Uh, another part of the response is, of course, regulatory, regulatory uh, responses. And you know that you has made uh, really important steps in that regard in uh, making platforms take risk management approaches and this is echoing a little bit what uh, Galina said how do we make sure that there is a transparent exchange of information between civil society researchers and the platforms and finally the fourth um, broad category within the toolbox could be uh, thought as a diplomatic responses. So what could be a diplomatic response to foreign information manipulation interference? Sanctions, uh, public attribution, something else. So these are still, you know, questions that we continuously are trying to answer and working in that direction. Uh, that's very interesting point, actually. And uh, let's talk about the long term resilience. How could actually R&D actions in the form of projects, funding programmers and overall policies and strategies um, support public institutions in Europe, at EU, um, NGOs, SCOs. Um, I would address this question to our panelists. Uh, please, Ms. Uh, Kalina Boncheva, um, how do you think, how could this um, resilience actions support maybe this how do you think about it thank you um so i think um it's very important to maintain sustainable and substantial research and innovation funding for independent research into the effectiveness of the platform's counter disinformation actions and for the monitoring and evaluating their effectiveness in the implementation of the code of practice against this information uh, because otherwise they're left to mark their own homework um, next, I would also say that it's very important to invest into the um, continued creation of new AI and other counter disinformation technologies and tools. Um, so, because, as mentioned already, this information constantly evolves, so we cannot uh, stay still. Um, it's important also to implement the recommendations of the um, EDMO Task Force on, um, on effective countering of disinformation. Um, I won't have time to go in depth, but la I'd lastly, I'd like to emphasize the need to ensure against the data access um, for NGOs and uh, civil society organizations as well, not just researchers, because they have also a very important role to play in their independent investigations. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Boncheva, but I have one more question to you. We know that uh, the effectiveness of AI-based debunking technologies decreases over time because uh, this information evolves and you have already mentioned it, but um, how do you think, uh, can you go into more detail uh, about this, how we can uh, improve and build long-term resilience, uh, maybe some ideas, maybe some projects, how do you think? So um, definitely uh, one very important aspect is to uh, continue uh, funding for, uh, for EDMO and the national EDMO hubs that exist because they are uh, working towards increasing the resilience um, both um, on the national and also uh, EU level. Um, I think it's also very important to um, ensure um, that um, we have um, access not just to the raw data, but also all of these fact checkers and, and verification professionals as NGOs, they are creating very valuable data that allows us to improve the, the tools that they in turn can then use to make their work more effective in the long term. And so at the moment, there is not enough uh, flow and exchange of data. So again, I'm coming back to this and the recommendations of Edmo in, in that regard. 
um, because this is really, really essential. It's uh, very also important, it's very important to put in place the necessary ethical, legal and infrastructural framework to make this possible, which also again requires very substantial investment on EU and national level. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Boncheva. And uh, my another question would be to Mr. Ono Hansen Stashinsky about long-term resilience, about uh, how how can we build it? What actions are necessary in the form of projects, funding programs, overall policies, strategies, uh, maybe some actions of public institutions at the level of EU, at the level of, of NGOs? It's a crucial question. And I think, first of all, we need to establish the cost effectiveness of interventions. Now we don't do that. Most of the things we just do and we find out that something has happened, but we don't really measure it. We don't even know how to measure it. So maybe we need a frame to measure cost effectivity because then at least we know that the money spent makes sense. The second thing, I think it would be very good to have little sprints for independent organizations, innovation sprints, to try out things, to have their uh, sort of experience from the field translated into uh, little pilots that could be done very quickly with experts around them. The third one, I think that innovation metrics should be applied to anything that already happens. Is it really innovative or are we in a cycle that has been there already? And I think one of the most important things for us all to do is not crowding out whatever is already happening by funding big things so that it looks like we're doing things, but maybe we're not in the end. So I would rather go for an innovative approach to really go to cost effectiveness and find out what can we really do that makes sense for our money. Thank you. And um, let's maybe go into some detail. Uh, how can education and specifically journalism um, contribute to this uh, resilience, maybe some specific form of projects, some programs. Uh, can you explore a little bit on it, uh, Mr. Uh, Onno Hansen Stashinsky? Well, I think that what is very important is that nobody gets excluded. The, the whole polarization does not help us. So I think people want to be feel, feel that they are heard and they are seen and they want to feel safe. If you do that, you build trust. That sounds very general, but there are already projects doing that, that they create trust by just listening and sharing information. Myself, I do that in the classroom with my wife. Together we try to create a safe space for children when there is trust and every device of subjects being discussed is not a device of subject anymore. It's just something that we think about together. And it's not that we as teachers know best. We all try to add to the conversation. And I think this makes kids feel included. And by being included, they feel that they really have a say in things. And it also takes the edge off of the, the sort of outcast things that they might be thinking. Because some of the things that we think that are not really mainstream are not just because we love it, but because it's part of our group. It's part of what we think we are, or we should defend as part of our group. And I think that if you do this in this way, that journalism and education are seen as platforms to start listening to each other and sort of on a peer-to-peer -peer basis try to explore uh, what we can do together, we build a much lower tone voice uh, in the discussions and we get more resilience not by excluding people but by including people and by listening and that's what we are doing in the classroom and it actually works thank you mr hansen stashinsky and um, my another question would be to Ms. Raimonda Miglinaite. Again, uh, you have already told us about the long-term resilience and uh, situational awareness and resilience building, but um, can you maybe specify us some actions, maybe some concrete changes in policies, maybe some programs that should be uh, launched or maybe some projects, maybe some support that should be directed now to um, some institutions, in your opinion, how do you think? Uh, wow, that is a complicated question. Um, look, I think uh, mm, 
I think uh, the diversity, uh, both in Europe and in its neighborhood, is actually an asset, and and uh, the sort of uh, the, our democ democratic uh, societies as well. I think they actually help us counter uh, disinformation. We often uh, stress that. Uh, countering disinformation is the whole of society approach, and this is not just an empty, you know, slogan. It actually takes the whole of society. It takes uh, government, you know, to invest in certain research, for example, or provide certain frameworks. It takes uh, uh, researchers and academia to really explore what's happening. It takes civil society to, you know, to push maybe certain actors, uh, you know, to take certain measures. So uh, it's hard to name specific projects, but I think um, it's important that whatever those projects are take account of local circumstances. Uh, we have many different and really wonderful examples. In Georgia, for example, certain organizations went knocking door to door uh, to speak uh, with people about uh, COVID-19 disinformation and, and anti-vax disinformation. You know, uh, not sure to what extent that can be replicated in the bigger countries, but you know, for a smaller context, perhaps this is something that could happen. So there are many different examples, and I think uh, it's 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 the I think the dogma of communication in general, know your audience. So it's the same for us. We must know our audience and, and our societies and adapt our responses to them. Uh, thank you. But um, how do you think uh, we have uh, talked about tackling disinformation through different strategies, through awareness, media literacy, debunking, pre-banking, etc. But Maybe it is already appropriate to start considering uh, disinformation as a crime, as a violation of... Um, it's not only the violation of freedom of expression, because in my country it led to mass murder of people, to the war. Um, the Putin's policy led to... Um, Actually, it resulted that people took guns and started to kill other people. How do you think, would it be appropriate to create a special task force to investigate it, to give it legal definition and to give it proper um, to give it proper answer, because this kind of disinformation, this really terrible kind of disinformation, it seems to me it needs a special um, special treatment. How do you think? Oh, well, uh, I mean, uh, this is something that we've been very vocal about as well at Universe Disinfo that uh, disinformation, pro Kremlin disinformation, really paved the way for Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, both this February but also um, in 2014. But um, if we talk broadly, for example, at the, some international level or an EU level about uh, criminalizing a certain uh, disinformation, for example, um, I think uh, I think we must be very careful where we draw the line. Um, there are, uh, broadly speaking, uh, there are certain types of speech that are criminalized already. Uh, think hate speech or incitement of terrorism. But if you, if we think really in very general terms, uh, saying or claiming that uh, you know Bill Gates will microchip humanity is very nasty, but it's not illegal, and frankly, it shouldn't be, uh, because uh, if if you look at certain authoritarian regime, Russia itself, for example, they have attempted to go that way and criminalize, uh, for example, claims. Um, that, in their view, contradict, uh, you know, the achievements of the Russian army, which is, you know, a way of of, suppress, of suppression and censorship. So, I think we must be very careful. And whatever EU response to disinformation is, freedom of expression is always a fundamental, fundamental right that we must always, always pres preserve and protect. But another element here that I would also add is about effectiveness of our response. Uh, again, talking in in the big picture terms. Uh, I'm not sure if criminalization or a task force would be the most efficient uh, way to tackle this challenge. Uh, and I come back here to the whole of the society approach, and I know that it's complicated, there's a lot of moving parts, but arguably this is, you know, where our strength uh, is as, as democracies, as democratic countries. 
I think it's important to understand, and uh, uh, this is an, uh, a thought that ha has been voiced by Edward Lucas, um, uh, who has spoken a lot on this topic, that we are really not dealing with evil geniuses, mm -hmm. but we're dealing with someone who uh, exploits vulnerabilities that are within our societies, without our policy responses. And it is up to us to, to plug those gap, uh, gaps and to address those vulnerabilities. And I think from that, we could draw strength. Uh, thank I you. Uh, thank you. I need to interrupt, unfortunately, because we are uh, near the uh, completion of our session. I would just add that several years ago there was a document by um, uh, EU researchers. I do not remember the names, uh, but they divided this information at several levels, and the last level was this information created by actually hostile foreign states who want to invade other states. And this uh, actually needs probably um, another discussion. And uh, I still believe that it needs a proper um, big response at international level. So uh, thank you, uh, dear participants. And let's uh, pass to a conclusive poll. Uh, we have another electronic poll for you, uh, another question. Uh, you have heard our discussion and in light of this discussion, how do you think what should scientists and innovators focus on to tackle this information? You have your questions, please um, choose your answer. Um, and then I will Ask two questions from the audience. I hope that, aha. Uh -huh. So I will try. Uh, I would ask probably the organizer. So uh, the most voted questions are interdisciplinary research into the behavioral and societal functioning of disinformation. Unfortunately, uh, <laughs> I have some problem with reading. Uh, I hope that you all see these answers that are very interesting for us. So um, thank you, dear guests. Thank you, organizers. And thank you, uh, our audience. I hope this discussion was really interesting for you. And uh, I think that this problem needs really a lot of discussions separate conversation on each actually of the problems that was voiced by other participants because this information is growing and we must be resilient and uh, we must remain democratic thank you very much and thank you thank you thank you, thank you.